This is Bishop Michael Burbage, and you are listening to the Walk Humbly Podcast. Podcasting from the St. Clair studio here in the Diocese of Arlington. Welcome to the Walk Humbly Podcast. My name is Billy Atwell. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese and your co-host. We want to thank those uh, who have contributed to the communications office through the Bishop's Lenten Appeal. Uh, obviously, the BLA, as we call it, supports a lot of different ministries throughout the diocese. But one of them is communications that made the studio possible and all of our um, communications outreach and evangelization possible. So we just want to say thank you. If you haven't yet, please rate this podcast or write a review wherever you're listening. If you're listening through YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and also ring that notifications bell. Sign up for our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org. You can also follow Bishop Burbage on Twitter and Instagram. On Twitter in particular, he provides a short gospel reflection every morning. You can follow the diocese on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, send your questions for Bishop Burbage to info at arlingtondiocese.org, or you can send us a message via social media. Before I bring in Bishop Burbage, just a reminder that National, uh, excuse me, uh, Natural Family Planning Week, Awareness Week, is July 23rd to 29th. The goal of this campaign is to focus attention on the church's magnificent teachings surrounding human sexuality, conjugal love, and responsible parenthood, as well as to inspire the faithful to find out more about natural family planning. Go to usccb.org for resources. You can also go to our website and check out our Marriage and Family Life Office. They've got great resources there, including mentors who can help you uh, learn more about natural family planning. I welcome your host, Bishop Burbage. Bishop, how are you? Billy, I'm doing well. I hope you and I hope all our listeners are doing well uh, also and enjoying this summer. It's hard to believe it's uh, July. We're recording this on July 20th. Where is the summer going? <laughs> it's disappeared. I have to ask, last last podcast, we talked about your, um, you're going to be going to Kingsdomen. Have you picked out which ride you're going on yet? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm going. Uh, I, I celebrate Mass uh, next Wednesday for all those attending right. uh, King's Dominion. At St. Mary's in Fredericksburg. Yes. Think, right? Yeah. And and this year, uh, the added adventure of actually going to King's <laughs> Dominion. And I did promise, I don't know what I was thinking at the moment, uh, but I did promise uh, the young people I would join them on some of the uh, of the rides, the amusements. And uh, uh, that should be very interesting. I actually <laughs> I actually like amusements for the most part. Now, yeah. I'm not so sure uh, what, what I have in, they have in store for me, but we'll see. It should be fun. And now, you said a ceiling of three rides, I think you said. Yeah, maybe right? like three. It? Well, maybe three. <laughs> <laughs> See how that goes. That uh, <laughs> well, it's be so great to gather with our young people and just to have fun together. I'm so glad that uh, young people from around our diocese, as we spoke about the last podcast, have multiple opportunities to to be with each other and have fun. The summers we should have some fun and relax a little bit. Exactly. Well, I'm glad. I look forward to a full report when uh, oh, yeah. at our next podcast. <laughs> you know about my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Something that I actually didn't even put in the notes for today, but I want to ask you about because it just it broke yesterday. Was um, a new Virginia transgender student policy that emphasizes parental rights. So Catholic News Agency is written on, I'll just read a little bit for folks' background. New education policies issued by the administration of Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin this week affirm that parents in the state will enjoy uh, broad oversight of their children while they're enrolled in public schools, with the state settling key questions related to the to school policies regarding transgender uh, identifying students. The new model policies re- Leased by the government, say that education rules, quote, shall be drafted to safeguard parents' rights and respect to their children and to facilitate the exercise of those rights. And boy, just opening the, the actual resource itself, it talks about, or the, this model policies, it's, it says it's um, empowering parents is not only a fundamental right, but it's also essential to improving outcomes for all children in Virginia. Now, obviously, we have Catholic schools where we have always operated with policies that are consistent with our faith, but it's good to see the government coming forward with something that's really focused on parental rights, something you've talked about for a long time. I was just curious, as this news broke yesterday uh, afternoon, what your thoughts were? Yeah, and uh, Bishop uh, Nestout and I issued a, a joint statement um, on, on this these uh, updated model policies uh, for public schools, and we commend it. Uh, and we thanked uh, Governor Yunkin, uh, you know, for for this uh, uh, for issuing this uh, these policies. Uh, you you mentioned the key points, um, the new policy, and everyone should read the policy. Yeah. Right? I mean, sometimes we just read headlines, but we should right. actually read the document. Uh, but the key points uh, are that they it, it restores parents' role 
the parents are the first teachers, the first formators of their children. So it, it's restoring that. So it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it requires transparency. We don't take parents uh, out of the lives of their students. And we know uh, that schools are form the whole person. It's like parents are entitled uh, and they do see their students' grades, their academic grades, their intellectual progress, right? Well, it has to be the same way with their psychological development and their emotional development. And all of a sudden, we don't make uh, policies with our schools saying, well, we're we're not going to tell the parents. That is absolutely uh, not acceptable. And this policy guarantees what should be the norm. So uh, it restores parents' roles and transparency. It also affirms the dignity uh, of the students, all students, um, and as well as the safety of students. Mm -hmm. Uh, The policy uh, does mention uh, that all students are to be treated uh, respectfully. Uh, there's no there's no such place, uh, you know, for uh, bullying or you know discrimination or anything like that. So it it, re, it respects the dignity and safety of all students and affirms religious liberty. Uh, you know, parents who send their kids to public schools have firm beliefs, core values, convictions, and they should be able to uh, be able to uh, when they trust their students to public schools, be able to have those values and convictions uh, respected. You mentioned. Um, the catechesis on a human person and gender ideology mm-hmm. uh, that I issued. Um, yeah. Again, I hope people read the entire, it's not long, the entire catechesis. But, you know, I said very clearly that special care must be taken uh, when interacting with children who experience gender dysphoria or express a belief in an identity uh, incongruent with the biological sex. Um I, I mentioned that authentic accompaniment, sometimes we throw out the word accompaniment, yeah. but what is authentic accompaniment, accompaniment requires remaining firm in the truth of the human person while patiently guiding children towards that truth. So parents must always and immediately be involved in any discussions with a child about such sensitive topics. You mentioned our Catholic school. So the yeah. policies are are consistent with what we believe as Catholics. Right. But I did reach out in that document to parents with children in public school. And uh, and I, I just encouraged those parents uh, to discuss specific Catholic teaching on these issues with their children. And and I see it in our throughout our diocese, and I commend our parents who are sending their children to uh, public schools for being vigilant uh, and vocal against false and harmful ideology. Uh, I, I think the one thing that has come to light uh, in recent uh, times is you you have parents have to be very careful yeah. uh, on what children are being taught, uh, what they're experiencing in a school, and have that discussion with their children and be vigilant. Um, and then, if necessary, to exercise the right as a parent to be vocal respectfully, mm-hmm. uh, but clearly. Um, and trust in God, parents need to be confident um, that a child's ultimate happiness uh, lies in accepting the body as God's gift and discovering his or true identity as a son or daughter of God. That never yeah. changes. Uh, a s- beloved son or daughter of God, the one who created them, uh, made them in his own image and likeness. So uh, I do commend uh, the governor. I do ex- ask our listeners to read the policies um, and, you know, grateful that re- this is restoring parents' role and, and transparency. Yeah, so if you want to read the, the model policy that uh, we're referring to uh, from the governor, just if you go to the Department of Education website, you can find it there. And again, it's, it's going to have things in there that we would not necessarily adopt in our Catholic schools. It doesn't mean that these policies Im- impose on us. It's just for those who are going to public schools, this is a huge step forward from a previous policy, which did the opposite. It created an opportunity for secrecy and special relationship between teachers and administrators and students, which we, we certainly didn't support. And then uh, if you go to arlingtondiocese.org, you can find Bishop Bird is catechesis on the human person uh, and, and gender ideology. And again, we're, that document has been downloaded thousands and thousands of times because it provides clarity for Catholics on what we believe with regard to these, these sensitive issues. So I know that wasn't on the agenda, but I appreciate you taking Thank it you on the fly here. <laughs> yeah. Now, you uh, had the opportunity um, just recently, this week, I think, uh, to provide a keynote address and hom- uh, to pro-life leaders across the, the country. Um, this is part of your role as chair of the pro-life committee for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. I'm curious if you could just share some of what your message was to them, uh, you know, with our listeners, and what were some of your takeaways from meeting with these folks from around the country who are dealing with these issues? Sure. Uh, yes, I was in Holy Toledo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Toledo uh, uh, for the uh, annual conference for pro-life directors uh, from around the country, as you mentioned. A good friend of mine, 
um, is the Bishop of Toledo, and uh, it did. It. This is kind of more of a personal level, but uh, we've known each other, uh, Bishop Daniel Thomas, since 1977. Wow. Uh, when we were young seminarians, and we have maintained uh, that friendship. And so, part of the joy of the fact that it was in Toledo was that we had that some time together. And I just was reflecting on that, and I mention this often, just that one of the great gifts of being a priest is the fraternity. Mm. and the friendships that endure. So, you know, we don't see each other a lot. He's in Toledo, I'm in Arlington, but we pick up just where we left off. And that's a beautiful gift of, of the priesthood. So on a personal note, it was just yeah, great to have that. That's wonderful. But I did have the opportunity to offer a keynote address uh, to our pro-life leaders from around the country. First of all, thanking them on behalf of all the bishops. I was speaking mm-hmm. in my role as uh, chair of the USCCB, the Bishop's Conference on Pro-Life Activities. Uh, so on behalf of all the bishops to thank our pro-life uh, leaders uh, for their incredible uh, witness and perseverance and dedication. Many of them have been at this work for a long, long time. Uh, and in their name, commend all those people for so many years for prayer and witness and advocacy. And to talk about, yes, we had a victory in the overturning of Roe versus Wade, but you know, our work is just beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, we celebrated that, but the celebration, in a sense, is over. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, now we're at real work. And, you know, providentially, in a sense, uh, we were in Ohio. And Ohio is having a, a very, very uh, big uh, ballot uh, uh, in, in November where, you know, there are forces trying to enshrine in, uh, abortion uh, into the uh, laws in, in the state. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, this... Um, you know, in Ohio, uh, where we would expect uh, that would not happen. Yeah. But the forces are coming from the outside, not yes. just from within the state. And they are pouring money. I mean, the tons of money going into advertising, which is false advertising, trying to deceive right. people. Um, but a, a lot of money um, and a lot of uh, strategies uh you know, to uh, get the opposition out. So Ohio bishops are doing a great job um, in providing leadership, but this is a very critical moment. Mm. Uh, But this is going to be happening in states, in all of our states, because now it relies uh, to the states, so we're praying for that. So I did speak to the leaders about, you know, of course our work has to be about changing laws, in a sense, getting laws that are pro-life enshrined in state laws. But we also, the way we're going to do that is, and you hear me say this often, is we have to transform hearts. Uh, We have to convince the average voter uh, that uh, we are, life is sacred for the pre-born up until the natural moment of death. Mm -hmm. And we are with the mom, we are with the dad, we are with the child, we will walk with them in every single way as a church. Uh, so, So abortion does not have to be a choice because we're there to take care of parents. Uh, we're there to help them with the, uh, the uh, uh, material needs, whether it be diapers or food or uh, whether it be housing or whether it be counseling. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're there to make sure we can welcome a new life, a, a child into the world. Um, and I think when people uh, see that, then they say, well, abortion doesn't have to be a choice. It can be a choice. Uh, and of course, too, through the beautiful uh, ministry of, of placing uh, children for uh, parents uh, who need to place them into adoptive families, loving mm-hmm. families. And so my, my talk to pro-life leaders, it's a critical time. Our work is beginning. Thank you for your witness. Uh, but let's continue to change uh, hearts uh, so that the right laws are enshrined in states throughout our country. And you've been clear on this, especially back during the March for Life and uh, during that time period where there was a lot of focus on this issue of, um, you know, the pro-choice movement quickly adjusted their strategy and got to work. We have to imagine what's, what new strategies we need as well. We can't right. do the thing that we've done for the last 50 years. We have to come up with new plans and new strategies. And right. this is all the faithful can participate in. You know, right. we, we all have a voice and all have a witness that we can offer. Well, as you said, you know, the, those who are, you know, promoting choice and abortion, uh, they they are very, very clever and not in a good sense. Right. Uh, but we can't be naive. We got to have, and that's why lay leaders are stepping up to help us who are, you know, have experts in uh, communications and strategies and fundraising, because we need, unfortunately, we need money to counteract uh, the false advertising that's that's airing. So I'm so thrilled. So many people have reached out to me in my role uh, who are very, very competent, have the wisdom and expertise to help in uh, different organizations, entities, individuals. So uh, thanks to all of them as well. Very good. 
Now, you mentioned uh, the fraternity that you experienced with your bishops, but I do know you have to keep a secret from some of your bishops. That was evidence this week with all the parish dedications and expansion projects. You don't want them to know uh, <laughs> yeah. How, yeah. how nice it's been at Arlington as of late. So the latest dedication was for St. Ambrose Parish, Father Fisher there, a uh, beloved priest there. Um, uh, everyone I spoke to who attended that dedication remarks at how celebratory it was, how joyous it was. Uh, for, for that community, but really, it's a it's an honor for the whole diocese to have a parish grow like that. And that, this isn't a unique case here all that much. We're seeing every year expansions and uh, new churches being built. Um, so, if you don't mind, talk a little bit about what you experienced when you were there. And, and yeah, no, like. we give thanks to God. We're we're a growing, we're a vibrant diocese, and it's all because of His grace. So we're thankful. I told the parishioners that day exactly what you said. This is a happy, blessed day for the parish, but really for the entire diocese. So we yeah. rejoice uh, together. Uh, St. Ambrose has been at this for a long they time. Have. This is not a short project. 14 years. <laughs> I told them that they get the Perseverance Award. Uh, yeah. uh, but through the wonderful leadership of Father Fisher and the wonderful team advising him and guiding him, uh, they have given us another beautiful church. Very, very beautiful. Uh, timeless in its architecture. Uh, beautiful, uh, sacred. Uh, using windows uh, from a, a church in Philadelphia, uh, so those windows were in storage. Or they, yeah. But now, and how happy those person must be in Philadelphia that, wow, our church, we, we gave the church, uh, our people who went before them uh, worked so hard. And But now that, that tradition, that memory lives on. The yeah. goodness of those people in, in St. Ambrose. That's so true. Uh, so it was, it's a beautiful church. That dedication, most people say to you, it's funny, most people say afterwards, you know, I've never attended this uh, 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 liturgy like that. Well, most people don't, right? Yeah. Like your church has been there How forever. How often does it happen? So, uh, but that liturgy, oh my goodness, it, 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 it is so powerful. It's one of the most powerful liturgies and it contains everything we believe, like everything we believe as a church through the actions, through the words and the symbols uh, are carried out in that. And so you really, it's a, it's a heavenly moment. Mm. And people were floating uh, out of the church, myself included. Um, we brought that church to life. Uh, and now, as I asked the people in my homily uh, that day uh, to make sure that uh, together uh, they continue to work uh, to find new new ways of reaching out to those in the community who have wandered from the church in a sense mm -hmm. to say, this beautiful church, guess what? These doors are wide open for you because this is your home. Come back because here you're going to embrace the love and mercy of God and also a loving and welcoming. It's a beautiful parish community. Mm -hmm. So pray God those doors are wide open and people will continue uh, to enter uh, into them. And congratulations to Father Fisher and everyone at St. Ambrose. Absolutely. Uh, Bishop, the next topic actually lines up with a, a question we received from a listener, which was, if you are attending uh, the Synod of Bishops in, in Rome. So if you could please comment on that and, and your reaction to the attendees that were announced uh, in the last week or two, um, that the Holy Father is invited as kind of a part of that group. Yeah, um, it's this in, beginning in October of uh, 2023, um, the Synod. And no, I'm not attending. Uh, the way uh, bishops are, are, those who are attending, have been, uh, were elected uh, by the conference of bishops, and they included our leadership, basically. Mm -hmm. But the Pope has to, has to approve them. So right. he approved those uh, we elected, and then he also appointed some additional bishops uh, from the United States. So uh, I am not one of them, and you know, I, I commend and thank my brother bishops who will be going, because it's a real commitment. Oh, it's sure. three weeks. You have to be in Rome for three weeks, wow. and you're you're there like Monday. I think it's Monday through Friday, but I think it's like seven, eight hours every day uh, for three weeks. So I thank my the generosity of my brother bishops and all those uh, who will be attending. That probably does also include the time they have to prepare. Uh, oh yeah, read aheads and then sure. follow ups afterward. I mean, sure. so a, yeah. an eight hour of of meeting, and then there's probably fourteen hours of right. total work. Yeah, and they're all diocesan bishops. Yeah, wow. So I don't know how things at home that. don't stop either. Right, so, uh, right. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's interesting to note that um, roughly a third of the attendees were chosen by Pope Francis. Right. Uh, others, were, as I mentioned, were chosen in different ways, such as you know through the bishops' conference. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, every country is represented. Mm -hmm. uh, and the goal was for the attendees uh, exactly to represent a wide faction of Catholicism from around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so some of the attendees uh, were not 
some you might have uh, uh, you know picked or figured out. Uh, but it's really wonderful to see how vast the representation is. But you know, I think I'm getting a lot of questions about this: uh, uh, what a synod is, or what a synod is yeah. not. Yeah, so a little clarity I, on that might be. Maybe helpful. I could take a few moments. Yeah, we're uh, hearing the same. So Bishop uh, Barron, a uh, favorite of I know of many in our diocese, is a delegate to the synod, and here's what he says: is you know to take the Pope at his word that he wants a dialogue. That's what a synod is, a dialogue. And I think it's good advice. Uh, the synod is about having conversations and formulating a plan. We do that on a diocesan level. Mm-hmm. We do that on a parish level. That's so we right. do it on a universal church level. Uh, but it's not about changing church doctrine right. or attempting to redefine the truth. Uh, the synod is not meant to be a legislative body. Uh, the delegates have been asked to come to Ro- uh, Rome and advise, advise Pope Francis on the best way forward. The Pope, this is important to remember, the Pope is free to accept or to reject uh, the final outcome of this multi-year process. Uh, The Holy Father is a Jesuit. That's his tradition, you know, sitting around a table, discussing, not being afraid to put every issue on the table. And I think that's how the, Billy, I think that's how the Synod's going to run. Yeah. Um, I I think that it's going to be many different Catholic voices from all over the world uh, coming together to discuss the church. Um, and I think this is what Pope Francis, this is what he always talks about, that we need to evangelize. We need to bring Jesus Christ to, to the peripheries, uh, those who have left the church. We just talked about, for whatever mm-hmm. reason, those who are feeling God is not with them anymore, or those who feel that the church was not there for them. So we, as a church, we have to figure out in this day and age how to be more inviting, uh, maintaining our principles uh, and defending timeless truths, of course. Um but let's be honest, uh, there are many people who feel as if the church is not listening to them or doesn't speak to them, and this can be for um, many, many reasons. So as church leaders, we have to figure out what's the best way. Uh, what's the best way? Just like I, I challenge the people of St. Ambrose, mm-hmm. the Pope has challenged us as a church. We can't just sit where we are uh, and wait for people to come to us. We have to reconnect with people. And what's the best way forward? And that's what the Pope is hoping uh, the Synod uh, will help to provide. Uh, he says he wants a church that is alive outside of parish walls so that er- yeah. wall so that everyone sees the joy of the face. So we need a roadmap, um, and that's what I hope, and he hopes, I believe, uh, the Synod will give us such such directions. Yeah, I appreciate that, Clary, because we, we've been getting those kinds of questions, too. Of what is a Synod? You know, yeah. not everybody's really paid attention to past Synod, so it's good to have that clarity. It's not about changing what we believe. Yeah. Um, all right, we have a couple uh, questions <clears throat> from the faithful. Uh, the first is, have you had any surprises in your role as chairman of pro-life activities for the USCCB? Well, I think the first would be that the amount of time that's required <laughs> <laughs> to do it. That, that's a little surprising. Uh, but uh, I have a great team at the United States Conference Bishop of uh, Lay staff uh, that keep me very uh, updated. But there's something happening almost every day yeah. with new bills being proposed or new mm-hmm. uh, you know, discussion items surfacing or new statements that have to be written. And you know, the staff is wonderful, but as chair, you know, they, they need the approval of the chair. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's there's a lot of constant uh, you know uh, need for attention, which I'm honored and privileged uh, to fulfill that role, especially at this critical time uh, in 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 the pro life movement and with what's upcoming uh, with the uh, election. Uh, so um, I think that, you know I, I kind of the biggest surprise is was I did see that you know um, perhaps what you just said that there wasn't a sense of urgency of redefining where we are now post Dobbs. Mm, yeah. What's the new strategy? Uh, again, you know, celebrating a victory is a good thing, but uh, we, we still have so much work to do. Uh, the landscape has changed, uh, and now we have to uh, readjust, as yeah. you mentioned, some of our strategies and moving forward. Uh, but it's an honor to serve in this role, and I'm supported by my own staff here in the diocese that, have such a great team that allows me to accept this additional responsibility. Uh, well, we were excited for you, to, yeah. especially like you said, the timing of that that two year term couldn't have been better. All right, the next question is: We often hear of lapsed Catholics returning to the faith. In your opinion, what are is or are some of the biggest reasons uh, that people uh, return to the Catholic faith? Uh, you know, what was the the impetus behind that that decision? After they're away, a while, yeah. After I mean, they've been away, yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that they. Uh, Come to see that uh, the, they come to see the empty promises of the world. Mm. So 
all of us, just for being human, we're looking for happiness. Uh, we're looking for peace. Uh, we're looking for serenity. Uh, we're looking for joy. And, you know, people begin to search and find those things and what the world promises will bring those gifts to them. And then they realize it's not enough. There's, there's something missing here. And then I think people rediscover that um, the church has the truth. Uh, the truth, the proclamation of, of, of the gospel authentically because the Lord has told us uh, where we find those gifts, where we find joy and fulfillment and happiness and peace. And it's only by embracing his gospel. So we don't give empty promises. We say, you know, mm. uh, to, be, uh, to be human, to be a follower of Christ, y- you're going to have the cross. There is going to be suffering, uh, but you're never going to be alone. Uh, and you're going to find the strength to carry. That's the Lord's promise. So that truth and that promise are fully revealed in the celebration of the sacraments. And then people, you know, begin to see it is is by receiving uh, the Lord himself in the Eucharist, by receiving his mercy, Uh, because many people who have wandered away from the church have also wandered a path that's contrary to gospel. But guess what? There's no sin greater than God's mercy, and all you have to do uh, is is to ask the Lord with a sincere and contrary heart to forgive you. Like some people say, you're you're one one confession away from being a returned Catholic. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, wow. uh, and that's that's all it takes. And then you're embraced in, in love and mercy of the Lord and of a parish community. But I do think, Billy, if I could just maybe expand on that question a little, kind of going. Um, elaborating a little bit on, you know, bringing people back to the church. Um, We all play a role in doing that. And I think it's important to remember that sometimes the way we as as Catholics can invite our family members or our neighbors or colleagues or friends back to church may not be that being the first invitation. It Mm. may not be, I want you to come to Mass with me, right? Because that people may not be ready to do it. And so sometimes evangelize may be something that maybe for a certain person isn't as threatening. So, hey, listen, our parish today is we're boxing food we've collected uh, because we feed the poor. Would you want to come with me uh, to help us do that? And they come to the parish, you know, and they're involved in a service activity or something like that. And it's, everyone loves doing that. Mm-hmm. Or come help. We're collecting food for babies and for moms and packing the diapers and delivering them. Would you, would you want to help me? Or we're having, we're having a parish festival. We live to come. Who doesn't want to go to a parish festival? Right. Right. Or we're having this great multicultural event because our parishes have so many cultures represented. Why don't you come to that? And sometimes it's those invitations that begin to open someone's heart uh, to like, wow, there's something more here, mm-hmm. you know. And then eventually say, hey, would you want to come to uh, come? come to, maybe then after a while, people's ready. Would you want to come to mass with me? You yeah. know, or, or some education program or something like that. So our evangelizing, getting people back to church, may, maybe sometimes it is, but often it's not like, I want you to come back to church with me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it has to be a gradual movement. Yeah. And we have so many things as a Catholic church to offer as far as education, service. Our parish is doing a sacred music concert. Why do you want to come to that? Mm-hmm. Or we're having like a, a beautiful display of sacred art. Would you want? So you know what I mean? Like it, it's it's yeah. it's gradually inviting people back, and then people have to understand. Aha! Here within the church is the truth, is the real presence of Christ given to us in the sacraments and lived out in the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's great, great uh, insight there, and I think most of us that know somebody who has returned to the faith, it's exactly one of those kinds of things. It's something very relational like that. Any um, uh, final thoughts? And then if you would send us off with your blessing. No, uh, just uh, uh, again, hoping that uh, there maybe is some time left for everyone to have a little rest and renewal uh, before we begin uh, kind of the uh, full force of students returning to schools and getting back to a more uh, disciplined schedule in a sense. Uh, (laughs) So I hope people are refreshed and renewed um, and and certainly uh, finding that rest in accepting the Lord's invitation who says, come to me. Um, And so uh, praying for everyone's safety, everyone's uh, health and well-being, and praying that together we will continue to walk humbly with our God. 
Thank you for listening to the Walk Humbly podcast. Make sure you check out more episodes on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter at Bishop Burbage, where I offer gospel reflections each morning and share photos and updates of what is going on in the Diocese of Arlington. Stay up to date with news, event information, and inspirational content by subscribing to our e-newsletter at arlingtondiocese.org.